Welcome to another episode of The Hole on the Corner. I'm Dan Peterson, a.k.a. Dr. Rockter. We're doing part two on Lafferty's short story, Snuffles, from 1960. I am continuing straight on from making that last one. And if you don't know, <laughs> making YouTube videos is <laughs> can be <laughs> exhausting, especially long ones. <laughs> um, so I'm having a cup of tea. Uh, shouldn't be drinking caffeine this late in the day, uh, but instead of coffee, it's tea, so hopefully it won't be too bad. But I need some uh, pick-me-up to get through this next bit, though I am excited to do it because the story just gets cooler and cooler. So part one, kind of put all the stuff in place for the planet, snuffles, the characters, the theoretical framework, right? And we're kind of wondering what this Snuffles character is about. He's mischievous, and uh, what are we going to encounter here? So it gets right to it with part two. It just comes in. I just love the way it starts. It says, when it happened, it happened right in narrow daylight. And I mean, <laughs> I just love when it, when it says that, when it happened, I'm like, oh, there it is. Here it comes. You know, like, what's going to happen here? When it happened, it happened right in narrow daylight. And here's how it describes it. There was an unusual flash of lightning, bright by even Bayota standards, and air snapped and crackled. And there was an unusual sound from Snuffles, far removed from his usual snokel snokel talk. And in a moment, benignity seemed to drain away from that planet. And that's exactly how I felt when it when I said, when it happened, it just like the benignity just drained away <laughs> in a moment. It's like, well. No more wondering what's going on here. Something bad's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so a nice bit of writing, I think, from, from Lafferty there to capture this shift. Um, so what Snuffles does is he had, it had been described earlier that he kind of would play around sometimes with their demarcated lines and would charge toward them and then back off and like he was playing around. And this time he does it again, but comes back and is not playing around. Um, now John Hardy, as we, have heard the commander commando guy it made a fetish of security so um, he's not caught off guard by this um, he's ready and he's got his his weapon up and ready to take snuffles down but it says he was fond of him so he didn't he thought he didn't think he needed to kill him to stop him he thought like a, a shoulder shot would do the trick and he, he liked him so he didn't want to so he took the shoulder shot it didn't work <laughs> and here's how it describes it <clears throat> it was ghastly but it was over in an instant. Hardy's head was smashed and his face nearly swiped off. His back was broken and his body almost sheared in two. The great creature with the foot-long canines and claws like 20 long knives mangled him and crushed him and shook him like a red mop and then let go. Now, you may have heard that Lafferty can be gruesome or grotesque sometimes, and this is an example of that. And I do, I will say some Lafferty fans are not as into this story because of that um, as they are some other stuff. But I don't know, it kind of comes with the territory with Lafferty, but I suppose this is a pretty extreme example. I mean, it's like, like I've described his characters and his description, it's all compact and succinct, you know, but... That kind of makes it even more effective to just this quick, blah, bloody, I mean, shaking him like a red mop. Yikes. So, yeah, so over and done for John Hardy, just like that. And it says that now Snuffles commands the, the weapon center. Nobody else can get to these weapons. Um, and so from there, he darts into the other caves and he kills three out of five of the, the remaining crew um, because it just so happens that Georgina and Brian, who opened the story with their conversation, are standing over in this field right next to the supplies and research center type area. And so all they can do is watch on in horror as this happens, but they're not in the immediate, immediate vicinity to be killed. Um, but Snuffles darts in and kills each one of these characters in turn, and they kind of each die according to their character. So it, it says that Phelan was a, a craven and that Snuffles cut him down in the middle of a scream. But I like the way it, it, we're warned here. It says, no one, not sure how he himself might die, should hold that overly against a man. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <clears throat> then it says that Margie, right, spreads her hands 
to snuffles and softly cries. And it says, the pseudo bear broke her neck, but with a blow that was almost gentle in comparison with the others. Billy, for his part, breaks out his pipe, starts puffing away and starts calling him snuffled boy and asks if he's noticed how trusting and pleasant he'd been. <laughs> and I think that's a bit of, I find that a bit of bargaining on Billy's part, but it's, he's, he's trying to play it cool and accept this thing. And it says that that was the last thing Billy Cross ever said, for the big animal struck him dead with one tearing blow, and the smoke still drifted in the air from Billy's pipe, which is really nice imagery. So it's like that moment in a horror movie where certain key characters are just dead and gone. In an instant, it's over. No more rooting for them, no more wondering. It's just done. It's harsh. <laughs> it's brutal. Oh, pretty freaky, man. Now, it says that though Snuffles is shoulder wounded, he was like black thunder coming out of the valley after the other two, for that clumsy animal could move. All right, so from here, Snuffles begins to herd them across the planet because he's getting them away from their supply and their weapons and so on. So he uh, can't quite catch up with them. The shoulder wound has done them, it's given them a bit, they already had some space and then he can't move as fast as he normally would though he's still fast. So they just begin this long, long chase of, you know, he lets them rest every so often while he rests, but then he charges again and they have to keep running. And so, and they realize this is an outlasting game. Their, their ship is coming back for them. Uh, I think it says that it'll be back in um, an Earth week. Yeah, so an Earth week away yet. So many more than, than that in, in uh, Bayota time with its four hour days. Now, as they're fleeing, it says they flee through a narcotic belt of flora and they're hungry and they can't, not eat so they have to eat the stuff and it says it had a weakening and dizzying effect on them yet they could hardly leave it alone and brian makes this comment this method of testing its products on ourselves may be an effective one but dangerous and so it says they dreamed vividly while awake and walking and began to suffer hallucinations which they could not distinguish from reality chief amongst these hallucination or these notions was that Snuffles was speaking directly into their minds. I love this, the way he moves from this uh, snookel, snookel, snook, snook, you know, creature to like articulacy inside their minds. And we're gonna get a ton of that articulacy. It's, it's really cool. But Brian from the get is convinced that this is not telepathic communication from this alien being, but that they're, they're hallucinating it and it's not real. And so he is going to continually renounce that that's what's happening, but with decree <laughs> decreasing, you know, vehemency. And uh, and he and Georgina are going to kind of debate it uh, all the way throughout, whether it's happening or not. But he renounces now his future belief in the nonsense uh, ahead of time. And this is where they begin to talk about whether it really matters or not if it's actually happening, if they believe it's happening, which is a fascinating, uh, fascinating idea. And, and then the narration says, yet whatever frame it was placed in, Snuffles talked to him from a distance. Okay, so that's the whole idea here. It's like, however you want to frame this, you're hearing this creature speak in your mind and that's kind of determining reality for you. And so we start to get speeches from Snuffles and, I, and here's the first thing he says. Why do you think me a bear? Because I am in a bear skin. I do not think you a man, though you are in a man skin. You may be a little less. And why do you believe you will die more bravely than Daniel? The longer you run, the meaner will be your death. And you still do not know who I am? And I just, oh man, I love Snuffle's voice in this. And it's something you get from time to time in Lafferty. It reminds me of Udin, the nothingness monster and past master. And there's other characters like this, which have interesting connections for me to other things I've read. Like, it reminds me not a little of Cormac McCarthy, the judge in Blood Meridian. Like basically these like sort of megalomaniacal uh, characters that are like so overwhelming. So like the judge in Blood Meridian or Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men or in a whole different realm of literature um, in C.S. Lewis's so-called space trilogy. The second book is called Paralandra and there's a character called Weston who becomes the unman and his speech is in there. And you know, this kind of thing reminds me of that too. So I, it's, it's really good stuff. Um, so Georgina's like, hey, 
Snuffles is talking in my mind. Is he talking in yours? <laughs> and Brian's like, well, yeah, it seems like that. He's like, it's a hallucination brought on by the narcotics and tiredness from travel and lack of sleep. And as he says, our shock at seeing our friends killed by a boy turned into a monster. Actually, there's, a, there's another um, printing of this that says toy turned into a monster. And both would work based on other stuff in the, in the uh, story. But I, 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 we'll need to look into the manuscript to see which is right. But I've seen it printed both ways in different, different quite official <coughs> versions of the story. So either way, this thing that they thought was innocent uh, or whatever proved itself to be a monster. And that, on top of everything else, is just making, it's just melting down their minds. Um, now, <laughs> Brian thinks that he has these sort of tests to figure out if something is a hallucination or not, and uh, Snuffles doesn't pass that test, so he knows it's a hallucination, but he, he, knew, but he can't be certain. He admits, I, just, I can't be certain. There's no way I could definitely prove this. And he has this funny aside about like, I can't prove that this pain I have in my throat is like not some Boy Scouts around a campfire somehow torturing me, which is a really odd little way to put it. He's like, but I don't think that's very likely, nor do I think it's likely Snuffles is actually talking in our minds. But Georgina demurs. She's like, I don't think it is unlikely at all. I think that Snuffles is talking to me. And then she goes on, when you get a little nuttier and tireder, then you'll believe it too. And he's like, yeah, I will, but it, it won't be true. <laughs> and she responds, it won't matter if it's true or not. Snuffles will have gained his point. Which is just, what does that mean? You know, especially when we get to the end of the story and try to figure out what is Snuffles. Like, <laughs> it won't matter if it's a hallucination or not because Snuffles will have gained his point. Like, if Snuffles is a hallucination, then what does it mean to say Snuffles will have gained his point? You know, it's very interesting. And she goes on to say, do you know that Snuffles is king of this world? He just told me he was. He told me if that, I, uh, that if I would help him catch you, he would let me go. But I won't do it. I have become fond of you, Brian. I won't help Snuffles catch you unless he gives me very much better reasons for it. <laughs> That's a great little sinister note in there. And uh, so Brian hears Snuffles talking in his mind again as this chase is going on. And he, it says that it was somehow a waste of time to intone the formality that it was hallucination only. So it's getting to that point where like, call it what you want. I hear Snuffles in my head. And here's what Snuffles says this time. You still do not know what I am, but you will have to learn it before you die. Hardy knew it, knew it at the last minute. Cross guessed it from the first. Phelan still isn't sure. He goes about and looks back at, at his body lying there, and he still isn't sure. Some people are very hard to convince, but the girl knew it, and she spread out her hands. So I love, it. you know, Snuffles is just creepy and cryptic, but here's a great example of how Lafferty will just have what seems like extraneous material suddenly in the story. Like, why are we getting this almost folkloric element of what is this, like, uh, Phelan's ghost? coming back and looking at his body lying there. And it's not really part of the rest of the story or the story world. But if you read enough Lafferty, this shouldn't really be surprising. This kind of thing happens all the time in Lafferty with ghosts or people ref returning from the dead or, you know, all kinds of things like that. So these little paranormal or folkloric type elements uh, that might just be you know, pinched in there, <laughs> here and there in a story that's otherwise not quite related to that kind of thing, is par for the course with Lafferty. And again, this is potentially just happening in their minds anyway, so that adds another instability here. But again, you know, some people may find that too much. I find it exciting to read fiction that has this, this weird quality to it. And I think it, it enriches it, really. So, a few days later, Bayota days later, Snuffles charges Brian when it says the bear had near hypnotized him into immobility talking inside his head, all right? And it says, Brian was trapped on a rim rock. Georgina had already taken a winding path to the plain below. Brian hesitated, then held his ground for the Bruins charge. He believed that he could draw Snuffles on and then break to the left or the right at the last instant, and perhaps the animal would plunge over the cliff. Now, I just want to say here that Rim rock is another one of these southwestern sort of, in this case, like a landscape term that you see a lot in like Cormac McCarthy or N. Scott Momaday and writers of the American West. And, you know, Lafferty just brings a little note of that in here. 
And uh, it's, it's the name of a character, an oceanic character, to add a strange paradox there, in uh, Past Master, and we'll look at that. But just another little note there. And then when it says the Bruin's Charge, Bruin is a term used uh, frequently in children's animal fables. So again, tying into things we've heard about Snuffles already. And here's how this, uh, this section ends. But old Snuff modified, but did not halt his charge at the last minute. He came in bottom side first like an elephant sliding bases, and he knocked Brian off the cliff. That's just a great piece of American humor writing. <laughs> um, I just love it. Came in bottom side first like an elephant sliding bases. So there's always that comic note, even as, you know, there's this horror of being chased by this alien bear and knocks him off the cliff, and he thinks he's dead. That's how that section ends. He's just, he thinks he's dead. So, part three, he awakes and he is being carried along, slung over Georgina's shoulder, and she's carrying him along. And she starts to tell him more things. She says that she noticed this other oddity about Snuffles. She says, and that lightning, do you know that it doesn't lighten all the time everywhere on Bayota? Only in a big circle around Snuffles as a tribute to him. I've noticed myself that when we get a big lead over him, we almost move clear out of the lightning sphere. And I just love that idea of a lightning sphere around uh, Snuffles paying tribute to him, which <laughs> this is just a, a fanciful conceit. But <laughs> I was thinking about how, you know, Alzebo Soup has done these episodes on Snuffles. And as it happens, one of the other Gene Wolfe podcasts called the Gene Wolfe Literary Podcast some years ago did an episode on Snuffles. They did it at LAFCON, an annual Lafferty conference, and they did it with a Lafferty scholar called Gregorio Monteo, which you've heard me mention before. Um, and he brings really good knowledge about Gnosticism and Carnival to the to the story. So that's worth checking out too. And I was just thinking like, okay, that's two out of three. The other Gene Wolfe podcast is the Rereading Wolf podcast. All three are great and they have, they're really quite complementary approaches that do different things. Anyway, I'm just like, we just need to get those guys to do a Snuffles episode and then the whole uh, Gene Wolfe podcastosphere will be paying tribute to Snuffles. But yeah. Um, so... To this, Brian reiterates that Snuffles is only an animal run amok, right? That's his phrase. And his seeming to speak in their minds is, is just their delirium. And so here's what Brian says. It is not accurate to personify it. And Georgina concedes that it may not be accurate, she says, but if that isn't talk he puts out, then I don't know talk. And a lot of his talk he makes come true. So I think that's, you know, another little important thing here that like, personification of nature, right, is a big thing in Lafferty. And again, the story Animal Fair goes into that quite specifically and kind of almost a philosophy, theology, and mythos behind that idea. And that whilst in a certain sense it's inaccurate, um, there can be bad anthropomorphism that doesn't really lead us into the uniqueness and otherness of non-humans. There is a good anthropomorphism, and this is in current eco-philosophy and stuff, that kind of helps bridge that gap and helps us see um, kin enough kinship and similarities to be able to imagine animal non-human life, non-human existence. And so she's like, it may not be accurate, but he's talking. I mean, it even speaks to me, and you see a lot of this in Lafferty, but like there's this field of research called biosemiotics, where you're looking in and noticing that there is sign making and interpretation and all that kind of thing going on from the cellular level right up to us, and that we evolve out of a biosemiosphere. It's not like this unique thing that just humans do. We do it in unique ways, but it's out there and it's happening. And I think, you know, there's, you could say that this is like almost like a little bit of symbology or allegory of that kind of thing of like, well, maybe not be talk as we know it, but there's talk happening here from the non-human world. Um, okay, not to get too far out into eco-criticism. So here, Snuffles starts to give this long disquisition. <laughs> and I'm going to read it because it's cool and it's, you know, a lot of what the story is about. And it, it, makes, the thing, it makes it take an interesting turn. Ah, let's keep it going. So here's what Snuffles says in Brian's mind. You insult me that you do not recognize my identity. When Hardy said that in many mythologies it was the bear who made the world, he had begun to guess who I was. I am the creator, and I made the world. 
I have heard that there are other worlds besides Bayota, and I am not sure whether I made them or not. But if they are there, I must have made them. They could not have made themselves. And this I did make. So it's just so odd. Like, the instability of this story and the undecidability of it is just so strange. But again, if you read it as a whole, I, I really think it's, it's quite inviting and interesting. But so he declares himself unequivocally the creator. But then he's like immediately has this like limited capacity and this doubt, this uh, creator self-doubt. He's like, I mean, I guess I made, I mean, I must have made everything else, right? I'm the creator, you know? So like there, this is, you know, not an omniscient and all-knowing creator. He goes on, it isn't an easy thing or all of you would have made them and you have not. And there is pride in creation that you could not understand. You said that Bayota was made for fun. It was not made for fun. I am the only one who knows why it was made, for I made it. And it is not a little planet, it is a grand planet. I waited for you to confess your error and be amazed at it. Since you did not, you will have to die. I made you so I can kill you if I like. I must have made you since I made all. And if I did not, then I made other things, red squirrels and white birds. Um, so again, you know, he's, he's really tetchy. He's really just like, it was not made for fun. He was like quite petulant, you know? So like this grandiosity about snuffles and kind of this creepiness and stuff starts to um, dissipate. Well, the cre I, you know, he's still dangerous, but like, you know, he's becoming uh, very, very flawed and, and limited. And it's, you know, coloring the picture of what he's like. But in that sense, you know, making him more dangerous, like you're gonna have to die because you didn't acknowledge how great my world was. He says, you have no idea of the achievement itself. I had very little to work with, no model or plans or previous experience, and I made mistakes. I'd be the last to deny that I miscalculated the gravity, a simple mathematical error that anyone could make. The planet is too small for the gravity, but I had already embodied the calculated gravity in other works that I did not choose to undo, and I had no material to make a larger planet. So what I have made, I have made, and it will continue so. An error, once it is embodied, becomes a new truth. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, snuffles the sophist. But at this part I call it like sympathy, sympathy for the demiurge, you know, because it's just like, man, it's hard to make a world, yo. <laughs> um, and, you know, we'll come to a part where Lafferty outside the story said that something about it being, you know, about uh, being a writer. Um, so there's that layer to the story. I think there's layers. I don't think that's what it's all about, but there's that layer to the story. But I, for me, what's interesting here is there's a sense in which I find Snuffles possibly the most developed and sympathetic character in the story, which is strange because we don't even know if he's re Well, we don't know if he's talking or not. <laughs> he goes on, you may wonder why my birds have hair. I will confess it. I did not know how to make feathers, nor would you without template or typus. And, you know, we didn't even know that detail that the, you know, amongst all these other weird things about the flora and fauna that the birds have hair, which is freaky and cool. And he's like, and are you puzzled that my butterflies sting and my hornets do not? But how was I to know those fearfully colored monsters should have been harmless? And, you know, so I love that idea that, that butterflies, and this is very Chestertonian, that butterflies are fearfully colored monsters. And he's like, so it seems like they should be able to sting, you know? Um, and he says, it ill befits one who has never made even the smallest but why do I try to explain this to you? So he's just getting, he's like, I want to justify this to my creations, so he thinks, so he claims. Uh, but then he's like, why bother, you know? So um, you wouldn't get it. Uh, so, I mean, it's just like, there's like, you know, there's like Job-like illusions going on here and stuff, but all kind of topsy-turvy and coming from like a non-omniscient creator and all this kind of stuff. Um, and he says, you wonder if I am talking to you or if it is only a delusion of your mind. What is the difference? How could there be anything in your mind if I did not put it there? And do not be afraid of dying. Remember that nothing is lost. When I have the pieces of you, I will use them to make other things. That is the law of conservation of matter as I understand it. So, yeah. And he says, but do you know that the one thing desired by all is really praise? It is the impelling force, and a creator needs this more than anyone. Things and beings are made to give praise, and if they do not, they are destroyed again. You had every opportunity to give it, and instead, you jeered. So, you know, I'm like, it's like 
almost like Neil Gaiman type gods, you know, requiring belief to exist, you know, in American gods or whatever. Um, but like here, it's like he needs praise or you die, you know. Um, and again, he says, did any of you ever make a world? I tell you that there are a million things to remember all at once. And there can be no such thing as a bad world since each of them is a triumph. Whether it was that I made the others and I forgot them is only a premise or whether I will make them in the future, and they are only now talked of out of their proper time. But some of your own mythologies indicate that I made your own, as in made Earth. And he says, I would tell you more, only you would not understand it. But after I have conserved your matter, then you will know all these things. <laughs> so it's all, you know, menacing and what have you. And Georgina says, <laughs> Snuffles is cranky with me today. <laughs> is he also cranky with you? And Brian's like, yes. <laughs> and she says, he says he made Beota. Did he tell you that too? Do you believe it? He told me. I do not believe it. We are delirious. Snuffles cannot communicate. And Georgina says, you keep saying that, but you aren't sure. He told me that when he chews us up, he will take a piece of me and a piece of you and chew them together and make a new thing, since we are belatedly taken with each other. Isn't that nice? <laughs> to which Brian responds, how cozy. <laughs> now, uh, Andrew Ferguson, kind of the, well, I would say the premier Lafferty scholar, um, who writes the intro to the uh, Library of America Past Master and who's working on a biography of Lafferty, some years ago, in his master's thesis called Lafferty and His World, which I believe is still available online, he draws on the work of the theorist Mikhail Bakhtin on carnivalesque, the carnivalesque, to read Lafferty in general and Snuffles in particular. And here's what he says about Snuffles. In Snuffles, Lafferty carnivalizes the exhausted SF space exploration narrative dismembering explorers and space alike so that both may be renewed and revealed in their new potentiality. This process of dismemberment and recreation, destroying the old to make possible the new, is central to the grotesque mode of perception, and it recurs throughout Lafferty's corpus as he continually chews together pieces to create new things. Time and again, Lafferty carnivalizes and dismembers whole sub-genres of SF to provide fodder for his reconstruction of artistic and ideological perceptions. Now, here's the thing. I agree with Andrew on this, and I have since the first time I read it. It just, like, rang so true, like, knowing the works that he was talking about and stuff. And yet, when you go back and close read this, it's, like, still very difficult. You're kind of like, well, yes, but, you know. And again, I think that's just partly the, the layers to the story. Like, that's one thing that's probably happening here. But there's still this, you know, irreducible, sinister quality to it as well. Regardless, Ferguson says more generally this, that Lafferty's destruction is always in the context of carnivalized creation. Whether as writer, bard, or pseudo ursine he dismembers that we may re-member. That is, re-member. So... Recall, but also put the members back together. So Lafferty takes things apart so that we can put them back together would be um, his interpretation. And I do think there's something like that going on here. And I do think that tempers somewhat the cosmic horror element. So in relation then to the ideas of carnival, that comes up explicitly in the story. Uh, Georgina starts to think about this. Well, first it says that as they're going through, they, they, you know, they're being chased across the planet and they realized that this, is, this actually wasn't just a narcotic belt of the planet that they were running through, but that the planet has been undergoing a narcotic season, right? And they call it Beota's built-in Saturnalia. And Brian laments, we have not been able to enjoy the carnival. <laughs> so this provokes Georgina to make this interesting comment. Snuffles shows up well as a carnival king, though, don't you think? It is easier to believe in time of carnival that he made the cosmos. I went to the big carnival once in Nola when I was a little girl. There was a big bear wearing a crown on one of the floats, and I believe that he was king of the carnival. It wasn't an ordinary bear. 
I am sure now that it represented Snuffles, though I was only six years old when I saw it. Now, NOLA, as it turns out, is an abbreviation for New Orleans, Louisiana, where Mardi Gras is held, and which is a carnival celebration of the Catholic Feasts of Epiphany, and many believe is rooted in the Roman celebration, Saturnalia, which, you know, Lafferty makes a nod toward here. So the, the element of the carnival is, is overt, in the, or eventually overt, in this story. And so if, if Snuffles is a creator, he's a carnival creator. And that's, again, I would recommend listening to the episode on Snuffles from the Gene Wolfe Literary Podcast, where Gregorio Monteo is able to go into more detail about this kind of thing. But basically, it's a reversal where up is down and down is up. And kings are paupers and paupers are kings and this kind of thing. And so a demiurge in Gnostic systems would be a minor deity that creates the world, not the, the true almighty creator. And so the idea, you know, being that, well, you know, that's the whole thing about it, though. It doesn't completely, to my mind, just easily map onto uh, Gnosticism and so on. I guess maybe Lafferty could be saying the carnival here is to pretend that Gnosticism is true and a demiurge made this world. But in Gnosticism, the world is evil. Flesh is evil. Matter is evil and it's something we need to escape from. Um, and that is definitely not Lafferty's view and that comes out in spades throughout his fiction. He has a sacramental view of nature such that every individual thing by being itself participates in divine being. So nature is good. Matter is good and, and ultimately divine. So you don't get that Gnostic separation that we're trying to escape from. And I think that's why there's all these notes of wonder in this story as well as the notes of horror. So it's almost like this meeting of Gnosticism and Catholic theology and, and you know, and, and speaking of Gene Wolfe, you know. <laughs> so Snuffles is Carnival King, and even this idea of a dressed up bear connects to like other Southwestern writers like Cormac McCarthy, who has a, a dancing bear on a stage, you know, in, in Leighton in Blood Meridian and stuff like that. So Snuffles starts to speak into both of their minds at once, and Brian is like struggling to like interpret this as just a hallucination. But they're they're starting to realize that they're working their way around this little globe and they're gonna come, they're gonna circle back onto the weapon center and they're like this. Does Snuffles realize that, you know? And he's not sure if he, he's like, he's starting to notice that things are looking the same. And he's like, wait, did I, was I repetitious in my creation? You need to tell me what's going on here. <laughs> you know, so he's like relying on them to explain it. And as to him speaking in both their minds at once, you know, Georgina's like, how can that be happening if it's a hallucination? And Brian answers, I don't know. But I prefer it that I prefer it the way it is. I never did like easy answers, <laughs> you know, true to his character. And then he says, the, the carnival is coming to an end. And it says, they moved in the agony of a cosmic hangover. <laughs> now, at this point, Brian becomes puzzled as to earlier when he awoke from being knocked off the cliff, how Georgina was carrying him slung over her shoulder, which, by the way, is a constant motif throughout Lafferty's fiction, women carry men usually on their shoulders and on, and on their laps. Um, but yeah, um, that's just a thing. And it's usually erotic in some sense. So go figure. We all have a good laugh about that, about Lafferty. Like, what is that all about? So when he's thinking back on this, you know, he's wondering how that could be, given that she's a woman and he's a man. And she's like, because I can. I would do it again if I weren't so exhausted. To which Brian says, damn it. You couldn't. You're only a girl. And this provokes one of the key lines from the story from Georgina. I am not only a girl. Nobody is only an anything. Our trouble here may have started with your thinking that Snuffles was only an animal. And he read your thoughts and was insulted. And of course, Brian persists, you know, in both disbelief and sort of a dominant view toward other beings. He did not read my thoughts. He is only an animal, and I will shoot his fuzzy hide full of holes when we get to our campsite. So the point here being that nobody is only an anything. Nobody is only an anything. You're just a whatever. It's almost, you know, Lafferty, long before this was a 
Trotsky idea is like against essentialism here, you know, that you, something is just essentially this and nothing more, you know. And like I said, multiplicity and the multiplicity of the way the characters are described is important in this story. Nobody's only in anything. And that's a key ecological, philosophical, cosmological, metaphysical mistake in thinking. Um, I think this story would like to indicate through Georgina. And that's the way Georgina becomes really important here. She, you know, the the emotional core was set on Brian being like, I want to find something that doesn't have a pat ending. But when he finds it, he embraces it to a degree, but it also resists it, you know. And Georgina is able to surrender more to it. And Georgina wants to cooperate with it to a certain degree, which as we'll see when we discuss whether this is cosmic horror or not, is really key to how Lafferty does this kind of like horror type fiction. And she asks, <laughs> And do you still think that Bayota was made for fun? And Brian's like, he says, the fun has developed a grotesque side to it. I'm afraid I will have to put an end to part of that fun. There's an elephant gun with a blaster attachment that I'll take to that fur-coated phony. We're going to have bear steak for breakfast. So he's taking on the commando commander role at this point. Although John Hardy was less like that. You know, he had mercy on Snuffles, but Mer <laughs> Snuffles didn't have mercy on him. So, the story ends with a final little action sequence where um, Brian has gotten back to the camp and the weapons center. And it says, He was inside the circle and at the gun stack when a roar like double thunder froze his ears and his entrails. He leaped back, fell, rolled, crawled, snaked his way out of reach, and the sudden shock of it bewildered him. And there was Snuffles sitting in the middle of the supply dump and smoking the pipe of Billy Cross, which is such a great image. You know, which kind of speaks to like a toy or a cartoon or something of a bear smoking a pipe, but there's this giant pseudo bear smoking this guy's little pipe. It's just so cool. And, you know, so they thought Snuffles doesn't know that the, he doesn't remember the world's round or, you know, or whatever, or he's just an animal and doesn't know, or whatever, however you explain it. But sure enough, he beat him to it. He's sitting there. He's like, raw. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, oh my God. And he, he says, his last thing he says in their minds is like, hey, if you knew how much trouble it was to make this world round, you wouldn't have thought I forgot. You know, but earlier he kind of did forget. So there's like all this ambiguity. And they're just too exhausted to further exist. So this is the denouement, or however you say that word. <laughs> it says, Snuffles knocked out his pipe then, as a man would, and laid it carefully on a rock. Then he came out and killed them. Georgina, the friendly iceberg, and Brian, who did hate a pat ending. And Snuffles was still king of Beota. <laughs> so there you go. They got did in as well. Now, there's a double coda to the story at this point. Appended to it first is a ship's report, where it says... No explanation of the fact that no attempt seems to have been made to use the weapons, though two of the party were killed nearly a week later than the others. All were mangled by the huge pseudo ursine which seems to have run amuck from eating the local fruit, seasonally narcotic. Impossible to capture animal without unwarranted delay of takeoff time. Gravitational incongruity must await further classification of data. So that's, you know, the ship concludes, oh, this thing went all, you know, cocaine bear on them. <laughs> you know, that's what happened here. You know, that's, and we don't know why they didn't use the weapons on him or whatever. So that's the ship's conclusion. And then the narrator weighs in basically on the ontological question here. It says, the next world that Snuffles made embodied certain improvements and he did correct the gravity error, but it still contained many elements of the grotesque. Perfection is a very long very hard road, <laughs> which is such a great ending to any story, but this story in particular. Perfection is a very long, very hard road. <laughs> so, no pat teleology. If there's something things are reaching toward and goals they're aiming toward, it doesn't mean, oh, it's all sweet, nice design. You know, it's like, well, there's grotesquerie and it takes a long, there's a lot, you know. Just, you know, I was really struck this time thinking that like there's this sense in which Snuffles, another layer, another way to look at it, Snuffles almost speaks for like evolution itself, 
you know, that like his description of how difficult this is, is almost like evolution personified going, hey man, <laughs> it's not that easy, you know, working with environment factors and genetic factors and the interplay between them and, you know, all this stuff, you know, and I think that it's, it's so cool. And I really think, um, you know, I really think some literary evolutionary sort of theorists and stuff could could sink their teeth into that, you know, because there's a lot of talk amongst um, eco-critics, especially this field called material eco-criticism that involves biosemiotics and stuff where they're, they're like, look, uh, evolution isn't all about, uh, what is it, natural selection, you know, Darwin's main idea, natural selection. It's also about natural play in that there are these interpretive um, things that are like gaming and play that happen between environment and person and stuff. And there's these big debates in evolution theory about whether, you know, it's all down to the gene, the selfish gene from Dawkins and stuff, or whether it's a, it's a more complex composite type thing going on, Stephen Jay Gould and others, you know, and that's like an ongoing debate. And I think, you know, Lafferty falls squarely on the side of, you know, that it's more complex than just like a selfish gene driving everything, you know. <clears throat> and, and in fact, I saw in, in the archive some handwritten notes he had uh, mentioning Stephen Jay Gould and his uh, concept of punctuated equilibrium. And I think he wanted to write some stories around that idea. Uh, maybe this is a story about punctuated equilibrium where, you know, I suppose, I guess roughly the idea is there's like sudden bursts of, of evolution that happen rather than always being this slow graded thing you know that like certain pressures create moments of evolution and stuff and you know i think there's like the, the debates are so harsh on that that i think maybe some people might even call that pseudoscience or something or just like not justified but then i mean i've seen where you know very recent theorists are still kind of backing gould over dawkins and that kind of thing and then vice versa and all that so it's an ongoing debate but it's just interesting you know and i was kind of struck by that but so that's the story now let's see if we can just say a few things more generally about it as a cosmic horror story. Here's, here's the main idea I want to say, is that for me, cosmic horror in the Lovecraftian vein, right, almost has, in a strange way, a kind of, a grim kind of closure to it, okay? Um, because, it, like a nihilistic closure, because it ultimately says the truth equals cosmic indifference. And this we know, right? That's kind of where that kind of story ends, right? So here's, here's Lovecraft's very famous statement about all this as an intro to the story, The Call of Cthulhu. He says, The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Which is a really cool statement, and you know, it's fun, and it's like, oh yeah, pessimism, <laughs> you know. Um, but it also says, we figured it out, you know. It, yes, there's a sense of mystery in that the knowledge is so beyond us that it would drive us mad, but that's what we know would happen. That's what, you know, we know that it points to our insignificance such that we would just be driven mad by, by a really clear vision of it. And so his characters often are. Now Lafferty, I think, Laffertian cosmic horror, if we can call it that, withholds closure. And it leaves the readers in this place of discomfort and dislocation and sort of undecidability about stuff. There's this unresolved tension between horror and comedy, I think, in Lafferty and, a, and in a story like this. And I'll be interested to see how um, Alzey Bosup interprets this. And I have seen people interpret Lafferty quite pessimistically, and that's fair enough. But I just think there's notes in here that suggest it's more complicated than that. And that sort of, that unresolved tension is what creates Lafferty's horror comic mode, which in its way is more, more unsettling than the closure of like nihilistic horror. And you know, his famous encapsulation of that, as I've mentioned before, is in Days of Grass, Days of Straw, where he says he adapts 
St. Paul saying, and the, the, we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And Lafferty says, we must work out our salvation in fear and in chuckling, in scare shaking and laughter shaking. So that trembling that comes both from like terror and from like humor and laughter, you know. And that like that's the fusion of those is like what reality is about. And, and he means it. I think he means it on both levels. And in the notes you hear in this story are all meant like the horror is real horror. You know, the world is dangerous and it is incomputable at its greatest level. And it does dwarf us in a certain sense. But there are also these notes of like, well, maybe there's, you know, some level of small meaning for us in there and that we can have. There is a right way to relate to each other and to, you know, other beings, non-humans and so on, that is more, you know, harmonious than, than uh, disharmonious and that kind of thing. And that that's not just some lost cause, a meaningless thing in a mad universe, you know, like Ligotti and Lovecraft and all this would seem to indicate. Um, so yeah, I think that's a little bit of what's going on in Lafferty and in Snuffles as, a, as like almost like a, uh, a token of this whole thing in Lafferty. Now I wanna say this thing from this theorist called I can never say this name right, Klyukanov, Klyukanov, K-L-Y-U-K-A-N-O-V, Igor, I think is his first name. And I drew on his essay, The Monstrosity of Adduction, A-D-D-U-C-T-I-O-N, uh, in my thesis. And it was just such a godsend because a lot of contemporary monster theory just doesn't entirely work for me. It's good in what it does, but it doesn't do enough. It, it does a certain kind of thing. It like looks at how we basically demonize uh, others, you know, um, through you know, gender, sexuality, race, and so on. And we do, and we make monsters out of them, and that needs to be interrogated. And there's like tons of great work being done on that. But it doesn't look at the monster more ontologically, oftentimes, and more uh, that there's that the monster doesn't necessarily have to signal just something that's like pure evil or malevolent or in some way that we have demonized something else that there's just a, what I call just an excess, just just a monstrous excess. And that, that's the more fundamental aspect of the monster in, in my construal of it. Which I've seen, since seen somewhat borne out in some recent work. There's particularly, I got to do a, an academic review for a book and collection called Monstrous Ontologies. And I think some of the essays in there are, are more along the lines of, of how I understand monsters. But Klyukhanov talks about monsters and that they are like this showing, this monstration, he says, that's not demonstration, which brings closure, but monstration that just keeps showing. And it's what I call in my thesis, unclosure. And I think that's the kind of monster that Lafferty shows us. And then Klukinov says this particular thing that, that maps on so well to Lafferty. He says, we may like figuring out anything that is pleasing to the mind, such as humor and wordplay, but the joke seems to be on us. As Floyd Merrill puts it, the world is an unfinished joke because we can't know the ultimate punchline. Yet, we still can and must enjoy the joke without the ultimate punchline because, and then he quotes Kant here as saying from his critique of pure reason, human reason, I'm trying not to read the whole long quote because it's, uh, it's too complicated. Human reason is given these problems, right? These like rational questions that we have about existence. Given to human reason are problems by the nature of reason itself, but which it also cannot answer since they transcend every capacity of human reason. So we need to reason about things that really are beyond human reason ultimately, but we have to, we can't get out of it. We're reasoning creatures, even though we can't reach sort of a, a rational closure in that regard. And that's what Kilukinov talks about being, you know, this playing along with a world joke that the punchline hasn't been given yet, <laughs> but we can play along. And that's what I see in Lafferty. I've mentioned this before in some other videos, that the difference in Lovecraftian type cosmic horror and Laffertian cosmic horror is that 
there is this opportunity in some sense for the reader and or the characters, depending on the story and the situation. And here it like almost doesn't, well, Georgina, I think though she dies, I think, I don't know, she's the hero for me. She is the one who is at least trying to play along with the unfinished joke <laughs> that she doesn't know the punchline to. And I think that's what's sort of offered up rather than like a, here's the joke, everything's absurd you're nothing but food for gods you can't understand type Lovecraftian horror, you know? So you are food for gods you can't understand in Lafferty, in this case, in Snuffles, for a demiurge, you know? But I think there is that sincerity in there somewhere, even though it's coming from this flawed perspective of, of that idea of like dismembering to remember, chewing together the pieces to make something new, um, a regenerative type quality to it that is there. And yeah, so... Very roughly, uh, it was kind of a mess, but <laughs> we'll leave it. We'll leave it there for the moment, and maybe I'll I'll be able to say something more articulate another time uh, when I when I respond to Alzebo Soup's take on all this. Let me just say this in closing. Actually, a couple resources for understanding the Lafertian monstrous, I would say, are um, in in Native American thought and in some e recent eco philosophy. Now, I've mentioned this guy before. Um, in this book, which is really great and relates to Lafferty a lot. And he's got a new book out um, that goes into much more detail about a lot of this stuff. Very briefly, monsters are an inherent and important part of, for in this case, the Cherokee cosmos. And I've seen this borne out in other Native nations, Native American nations as well. Um, but in the Cherokee cosmos, they form an underworld, a watery underworld that is dangerous for humans to visit, but which humans must visit from time to time uh, for resources in creativity and ethics and all kinds of stuff. And that's what kind of monsters do. They are dangerous, and some of them are evil, but not all of them. And they don't just represent evil, they represent, you know, um, dynamism, I guess, you know, vitality of a very dangerous sort, but that has to be worked with. Now, in this book by Timothy Morton, his idea of dark ecology, he has these three layers of darkness, the top, middle, and lowest, which is the deepest and the most fundamental, meaningful layer. And this first layer, he says, is melancholy, that depression-type darkness. And this is like thinking about ecology and stuff. And then he's like, there's this, the next layer is the uncanny, where things are really weird and strange. And then finally, you get into the deepest layer. And I just couldn't believe what he said the deepest layer was when I got to that part of the book and how well it maps onto Lafferty. What's the deepest layer of dark ecology underneath, deeper than, more fundamental than the melancholy and the uncanny? Comedy. Comedy <laughs> is the deepest layer of darkness, the comic, in which he includes like kitsch and toys, you know, relating here to snuffles and stuff like that. Um, and this book is, you know, full of monsters and the monstrous, and it's all about monsters swallowing monsters swallowing monsters, and that's what we're inside of. And again, there's this sense that deep, deep down inside the belly of the beast, we need to play along. That's how we go through. There is no getting out of it. There's only going through it. And there's this sense of playing along. So I think to the degree that Lafferty has a darkness, it's the darkness of comedy of this deepest layer that uh, is mysterious and in which there, well, frankly, let's just say it, there is some hope, but it's not straightforward. So that's my take on, on um, Snuffles and Lafferty's Cosmic Horror. So excited to go listen to these other episodes and then come back and, and do a response video. So th if you made it through all this, you're heroic. I hope you got something out of it. Let me know. I want to do this better and better, you know. Um, so, you know, please interact if you can and if you were able to listen to all of it so I can figure out how to do this better and better. But uh, like I said, I want to hear this kind of long play uh, talk about Lafferty. Whether I did it justice or not, you know, that's another question. But, you know, we're getting through. We're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll learn as we go and get better and better. Um, so thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Take care.